Time appears to be winding down over at the Idaho State House. Lawmakers are working to get budgets passed and final bills considered. And that includes an effort looking at Idaho's abortion laws. It's here, it's here! Tree Fort 2023 rolling through town with great music and awesome company. But it's not just about the music, oh no. Our team heads down to the high tech highlights, a window into the future. Get to know Idaho. We are jumping in the time machine to highlight an Idaho innovator. So grab your pioneer outfits. The 208 starts now. Welcome to the 208. Brian Holmes has the day off. And to start the 208 for you, no surprise, we are tracking what could be the final days of the 2023 Idaho legislative session. We'll take a live look right now at this hours. This is a live look as lawmakers are running through a major list of budgets and bills. The golden question at this point is, when will lawmakers officially adjourn for the year? Well, they can't do that until budgets are passed, but they are making solid progress on that front. I will say to any of the uh, insiders for the legislature, we're keeping a close eye on if Idaho will get a state dinosaur that is expected to happen in the next half hour or so. So don't worry, we will get to that. But meanwhile, back to the main business. While lawmakers are pushing through the appropriations, there are a few other items still out there for consideration. And that includes Idaho's abortion laws, specifically the criminal abortion laws. And medical experts around the state of Idaho have expressed concerns about how the law is written. They say it could be a little too general when it comes to a situation where a doctor is wondering if they should legally do an abortion or not. So that feedback was taken in stride from lawmakers and they are working with stakeholders to make sure that the law is written in a way that works for medical stakeholders and lawmakers. And there's been a lot of attention on abortion in Idaho over the last few years, court decisions, legality questions, the full nine. But this effort to examine the law is welcome news for many stakeholders. So what are lawmakers looking at in the final days of the session? Let's take a look. As lawmakers are heading into the end of the Idaho legislative session, they still have a major topic to tackle, Idaho's abortion laws. Recent court decisions have given Idaho lawmakers insight to how they can best word the law, a law that some in the medical community say was vague. House Majority Leader, Representative Megan Blanksma, planned to see a pitch on the topic advance this week. Multiple parties had worked on it, but in the end, it, it wasn't enough to satisfy everyone. So we're going back to the drawing board. I believe we have some new language that we're, we're working out, and we're going to try to put something together to get it out by the end of session. Although the exact bill is still being worked out, Blanksma and multiple stakeholders have drafted ideas for a clear and concise law. One change discussed by lawmakers and stakeholders is a priority for pending abortion legislation. I think the general goal, the one thing that all parties seem to be uh, agreeing on is getting rid of the affirmative defense. That, that seems to be something that everybody agrees on, and then the details around that is where it gets sticky. So I, I think we're just waiting to see what we can get everybody to come to the table on, and I would think that you would see something here shortly. As it stands now, Idaho's code outlaws abortion in all cases, with the exceptions of rape or incest that are reported to law enforcement or when the pregnancy threatens the life of a mother. The current law includes an exemption, an affirmative defense, that must be proven in court by a preponderance of evidence, more likely than not. For abortions performed when a doctor, in good faith medical judgment and based on the facts known to the physician at the time, has determined that the abortion was necessary to prevent the death of a pregnant woman. As some believe that affirmative defense bar was too high, Blanksma says insight from the judicial system through court cases has been valuable. I would argue it's not a cleanup bill. I mean, we obviously had a very good decision from the Idaho Supreme Court. I think this is just essentially codifying what we already know based upon that decision and just making it just a little bit clearer. As lawmakers were set to hear a bill in committee created by legislators and stakeholders on the topic, the Idaho Republican Party sent an email blast claiming that the proposal was from a closed door backroom deal to give doctors leeway to perform abortions. That email created questions about if the abortion law will see context added. I am not concerned about that email from the chairman because we are working on solving a problem and that's what we're doing. Um, that bill might not be the answer. We didn't know that it wasn't the answer until very late at night and so we kind of shelved it. We're working on a new solution because I think what, in the end, the, the Republicans of the Idaho House are focused on finding solutions to problems and that's what we do. 
To put it simply, lawmaking is not always a linear journey. Nothing is static here. Everything's always moving. And so we're trying to do the best with the tools that we have. And in that process, sometimes stuff comes out that people don't necessarily like, but there's always the opportunity to go back. So with time winding down, what does the timeline look like for abortion legislation? I think quickly. They're still working on it. I still don't have an RS to introduce, but I would look to maybe tomorrow morning. I'm not sure. I don't have a firm commitment on when we're going to do that yet. All right, so lawmakers are working hard at this hour, but what does that mean for their goal of being done by the end of this week? Well, I asked the majority leader who we just heard from for her thoughts, and yes, she tells me there's a concerted effort to get things wrapped up. Yeah, I, we want to be responsible with taxpayer dollars. We really do. And the longer we're here, the more money it costs. And our target end date was actually this Friday. And I think we'll meet it as far as our job responsibilities. Unfortunately, we're going to wait on the Senate a little bit. They, they move at a different pace and they have a different system. So the caveat here for you at home is that plans change and there can always be a bill or debate that hangs things up longer than expected. We've seen this in years past and we saw that this morning in the Idaho Senate. But anyways, we will follow this until the end. But looks like things are winding down. We'll keep a close eye on that one. Up in North Idaho, Coeur d'Alene School District has a $25 million levy on the ballot for their May 16th election. And the superintendent up there isn't messing around, threatening to cancel all extracurriculars for the next year if this levy doesn't pass. Now, last night, the school board had a special meeting to talk about the levy, which would ask median priced homes to pay an extra $6.50 a month. And tensions were high at the meeting. Teachers worried about losing their jobs. Taxpayers angry about the lack of transparency, they say, and how the levy would be used. So today we reached out to the superintendent of CDA, Coeur d'Alene School District, Dr. Sean Hawker, to see if things like sports and bands were really going to be on the chopping block if the levy doesn't pass. In a statement this afternoon, Dr. Hawker said, quote, Consistent with what we have been telling our community for the past four months, without the levy we will be forced to cut $25 million from our budget. And these cuts include all extracurricular activities. They say that their budget year begins July 1st, 2023. And Dr. Hawker said that the district spends $1.5 million on activities. And if the levy fails, then the school would lose 25% of their operating budget. So if the levy doesn't pass, say goodbye to sports band and all the like starting next school year. But also, 300 employees could be out of a job due to the budget cut too. So needless to say, a lot of a load on this levy. And speaking of potential sports, maybe you've made a March Madness basketball bracket and maybe it's not doing so well. A lot of the big teams already got knocked out. But did you make a bracket for the gym, the gem state March Madness? Well, what, you, what is this, you ask? Well, it's a very niche take on the popular March activity. This is the third annual March Madness, Idaho Historic Places Edition. And this is, it's all about historic gymnasiums. So the gym state, the gem state, you can see there now. Feels appropriate sticking with the sports theme. The Greeks invented the gymnasium, but not the kind we know and play in today. The oldest gyms in Idaho is actually the Potlatch Athletic Club Gym. It was from all the way back in 1916. So you got to go vote on your favorite Idaho gyms in this year's bracket. And we're a little disappointed that we only discovered this today because they are already in the final four. The final four is the second most important round in the tournament next to the championship. So better late than never. In the final four for you is the Payette High School Dome versus the Axe Line Gym at the Albion State Normal School and Lava Hot Springs Gym versus Arco Recreation Hall. You can go on uh, Google and there's a Google form that you can figure out. It's on your screen right now. There it is, gymnasium. All right, 208, we'll be back after this. Still ahead for you on the 208. We are taking a look back at Idaho's history past. And you're going back to the pioneer days for a story you've probably never heard about early innovation and the woman that made it happen here in the Gem State. A little later, we're sending it down to Tree Fort. Andrew found some really cool stuff that you have to see. We're talking technology. Also, what a great time it is for you to send us a comment, question, or maybe just a hello. We read all of your texts. Oh yeah, right, our number, 208. 321-5614. If you send us something, make sure to add hashtag the 208 and please sign your name. 
We're going to read some of your texts live coming up. All right, friends, let's get to know Idaho together. And we're nearing the end of Women's History Month. And there are a lot of amazing women who have helped shape Idaho into what it is today, including a woman named Nellie Burgess Suddeth, who came to Idaho and built a life on a ranch that she started herself. Now, according to an article in 1969 by June Warburton in the Glens Ferry Pilot Historical Edition, supplement of 1978, Nellie Burgess was born on July 1st, 1873 in Streeter, Illinois, and she attempted the first college to accept women in the United States, Overline, and then she went to the University of Michigan. Now, according to an article by Anna Bailey from Brigham Young University, N Nellie later moved west to treat a constant cough, and she saw an ad for a land raffle in Idaho, and that sealed the deal. She left behind a job at the Chicago Daily News and headed west, just like her dad had done for the cold rush in California, both looking for adventure and independence. And independence is what Nellie found in Idaho. She arrived in King Hill, right off of the Snake River, and that's where she entered the land drawing. Her ticket was pulled, and she got her second choice of 40 acres of land near a bend in the Snake River, just east of Glens Ferry. There, Nellie worked hard and fixed up the land, so it fulfilled the Cary Act of 1894. And the Cary Act is actually super interesting. Uh, it allowed states to get up to 1 million acres of undeveloped arid public land as long as it could be made agriculturally productive. So Nellie went to work turning her land into a farm, and she called it the Rainbow Ranch. Her 16-year-old nephew, Glenn Mills, joined her in 1912 to help with Nellie's safety, but also the ranch. She grew alfalfa, wheat, corn, fruits, flowers, and a much more. She even grew a 40-pound watermelon. It's a big one. Later, she brought in livestock, and to round it all out, Nellie learned how to hunt and supply meat to become completely self-reliant. Then in 1914, Nellie married Dave Suddeth, a neighboring rancher, and she was on the ranch until 1968. And then she was the only original settler left from the King Hill land drawing. And she did die later that year, but Rainbow Ranch has since been sold, and there's still a plaque on the ranch for Nellie that says, quote, early King Hill pioneer, which is exactly what she was. And the King family still owns the homestead and is ranching it out to this day. The family has kept the land thriving, just like Nellie Burgess Suddeth did so many years ago. Just a piece of Idaho history. Show you, it's a lot of people that came before us.
energy and the atmosphere is charged over in downtown Boise and it's not because of the weather. Right now, Tree Fort Music Fest is happening, kicked off this morning at 930 with rock and roll yoga. How cool is that? And we do still have some showers that we're talking about today. They're pretty scattered in nature though, so right now we're not seeing too many showers over in downtown Boise, but we still are hanging on to the potential of seeing some of those stronger showers, maybe a couple run rumbles of thunder and some strikes of lightning with that and some brief downpours. But you can see right now looking pretty dry in the view towards downtown. And if we look at our radar, that does agree with that. Nothing significant coming down the pipeline west of us for Boise right now. But you can see there are some stronger storms over in Twin Falls for the moment. But if we zoom in on Boise, it looked like there was one small shower that could graze the area, but it stayed a little bit south. So it's staying a little bit drier today for Tree Fort, which is good news. And there's a lot going on in the weather. So here is what we're looking at. Those scattered showers continue tonight. And again, we maintain that potential for some of those to be a little bit stronger Then a cold front is moving in late tonight and in the overnight hours. And then we've got snow and colder temperatures along with that cold front. So here is where it is right now. It's draped off the coast, but it's just barely coming on shore over in Oregon. So that's going to track east and bring us some stronger snow showers, really like a blast of snow overnight. And so those mountain locations are going to see a little bit more accumulation. Valleys are going to be seeing a little bit of that snow as well. Yes, snow. So if you're waking up early and going to tree for again in the morning, you may see a little bit of that snow lingering. Temperatures are right now in the 50s, many valley locations, 40s in eastern areas, including Boise, 49 degrees right now. And if we talk about what's going on tonight, you can see those temperatures are a little bit more moderate, still staying in the 40s before we see that flip to snow in the overnight hours. And it's going to feel really different for you compared to tomorrow, almost a 10 degree drop with some of those temperatures, including Saturday as well. So colder temperatures will be on the way for all your tree fort festivities. So it really looks like, unfortunately, the better end of the weather, Joe, was yesterday and today so great time to try and go down i know there's a little bit of showers too but for right now it's dry at the moment all right well real generally what would you tell people to wear tomorrow night and saturday like raincoats enough or something heavier i would go a little bit heavier because it's going to be colder lows are still going to be in the 20s once the sun goes down it's going to get cold really fast so maybe a little bit heavier maybe a little bit waterproof as well and definitely some shoes that'll be waterproof too no one wants oh, yeah. wet feet all after. no no suede shoes skip. no suede if you're, shoes. if you're hanging on for some suede shoes you wanted to break out skip it all right, so no blue suede shoes this no. weekend. All right, Sophia, appreciate it. We'll talk soon. Thank you. And maybe you don't want to deal with any of the weather. Maybe you're looking to just not get caught in a rainstorm at all down at Tree Fort. Well, you're probably not alone, and we have some good news for you. Hack Fort and Film Fort, they're one of the many inside attractions because you can't get any of their nice equipment wet. And it's cutting-edge technology. It's amazing stuff. All of it on display for people to enjoy. And some of the things you'll find down at Tree Fort, you won't find anywhere else. Anywhere else. And at least it's unlikely. And that includes Garden City's Full Tilt Studio and their cinematic robot named COG. The Full Tilt says that's the only robot of its kind in the whole state, drawing strong interest from a wide audience. Andrew Bartling tells us the deal. To know where we're going, we first have to know where we've been. Totally. Paige Stevenson puts that principle on full display. Yeah, so when I was a kid, there was a MIT robot named Cog. Like Cognition. Sort of bring that, that early inspiration to this, this robot. Paige stuck it with the same namesake. This is the tablet. This is the brains. But tasked it. Kind of the future of filmmaking. For his own purpose. You'll see it now. Like when you watch ads, you're like, Oh. And the sneak peek presented on the monitor is catching attention. Yeah, I mean, that's what it's about. From BSU student um, Elias Willera. Exposing yourself to different, I guess, technologies and different ideas. Ideas. Oh, yeah, for sure. Made from scratch. I don't know if you've heard of scratch.mit.edu. It's a software to make video games and a passion pushing Elias to Boise State. I'm studying the games and interactive media mobile degree. And this is one of his first looks at the future of his own industry. Kind of blending like a virtual world or a game world with something filmed in real life. The video games are crazy now, and so this kind of talks to both worlds. And so this is a good membrane for shooting both real and not real things. Cog's a long way from the camcorder and fishbowl TV combo. You gotta get on board. And a long way from home. <laughs> Spokane guy. For filmmaker Jason Overdorf. Yeah, there's no way I, I could ever capture some of that stuff. And so it's pretty cool to actually see one in person. You know what I mean? And I hope that at some point it becomes more uh, attainable 
by small filmmakers like myself and stuff. That's because where we're going costs some serious cash. Yeah, it's about $120,000. But this was all state of the art at one point. The evolution is awesome, man. I dig it. But someday we all retire to being just another cog right. in the machine. You know, it was important to me to, to have a buddy, you know. This is, this is our new coworker. Well, Full Tilt's new co-worker can replicate the same motion over and over again. He, they say the error is about the size of a human hair, so it's also efficient, too. Paige says he can get eight hours of work done in a single hour. He kind of tells me that it's a tripod on steroids, Joe. That was, like, the most mundane way, I guess, or layman way, I should say, that he could break it down. So, uh, yeah, it's a really good tool for their company. It's very interesting, and uh, everybody I talked to said, I came here specifically because I heard about this and I want to see it. I've never actually seen him in person before. So it's down at Treeport. Okay, here's my question for you, Andrew. What happens when COG meets up with ChatGPT? Is that just game over? That's, that's ultimate AI? That's the first thing I thought of, actually. Think about what we do for a living, like yeah. a broadcast journalist. You shoot video, you talk to people, you pair it together. Uh, that, that would be a problem for, for our jobs, um, but uh, it'd be pretty interesting. So I thought that same thing, too. Well, the robots are on their way. Uh, also, Andrew, before I let you go, uh, big game tonight for the Zags. That's true. I did meet a fellow Spokenite out there today. Zags are playing UCLA, my favorite rivalry. Go Zags. We'll see what happens. Today. All right, go Zags. And, of course, if you're not a basketball fan, you can go catch all the Tree Ford action here tonight. And like Andrew said, Tree Ford has a lot of free opportunities to experience all the different forts, like free music at the Record Exchange right by the Neuralux in downtown Boise. These sets are all for free, and they are all ages, and you do not need a Tree Fort Pass. And the show for today started at 4.30, but you can go listen to Causeway perform tomorrow night at 5 p.m., all for free, and a few other bands this weekend as well. Find a full list of the lineups, concert times, and more in our Tree Fort Guide on our website, ktvb.com, or better yet, you can just text the word Tree Fort to the number on your screen. 208-321-5614, and we'll send that link directly to your phone so you got it all in the palm of your hand.
All right, let's put this Thursday 208 edition to sleep. We'll look at the comment Tron 7000. Oh, the guys in the back did a great job on that one. All right, this person says, and this is on the Quarter Lane School District stuff. This person says, I was the geeky kid in high school who was as far from athletic as you can get because of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. However, band and choir saved my heart and soul and gave me a creative outlet that my body could handle. It makes me so sad that the Quarter Lane School District is being placed in a position where all extracurricular activities are potentially on the chopping block. What happens to those students who are like me? Begs the question, that's from Michelle. Michelle, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's a great question up in North Idaho, they've got some big decisions to make on that levy if it doesn't pass. This person says, hashtag the 208, whether the legislature eventually approves creation of an Idaho state dinosaur, at minimum this legislative session will have itself a fitting mascot representing its remarkable accomplishments. So there's a, a blue dino. I like that one. This person says, will Idaho get a state dinosaur? We're, we're hoping so. I guess we'll find out and tune into the 208 tomorrow. That's not a dinosaur. But that's a cute dog. All right, see you tomorrow.